What's up, y'all? It's Mr. Ernest Krim III, your favorite black history teacher. And I am so excited, y'all, because this is the very first episode of the Black History Save My Life show. So what I need you to do right now is to click that subscribe button so that you can get these episodes exclusive to you right on your YouTube timeline, all right? Check this out. So I know you got this book. This book right here, my first release, Black History Saved My Life. This book details the instances in my life where black history would provide the vantage point to give purpose and meaning in my life, culminating with a hate crime that went viral in 2016. It saved my life because it allowed me to respond appropriately in various situations. But here's the thing, y'all. It's not just about my life. I realized through this period, this revelation that I will come across, that there are other people in this world, other people who have become successful in uh, the realm of service and business and so on and so forth, that have committed themselves to something because something happened. Something gave them an awakening. And that's what I'm doing with this interview series. I'll be talking to thought leaders, successful people who are committed to service to figure out what exactly was it that clicked that allowed them to commit themselves to making our community and our world a better place? And with that said, the very first episode is me interviewing my mom. This is important, y'all, because in my book, after I wrote it, I realized that at least one third of the entire book talks about the impact that she had on my life. It wasn't intentional. I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write this book featuring my mom. It just so happened that as I became conscious throughout my life, she was the one that played the biggest role in determining that level of consciousness because of her commitment to black history herself. When you watch this, take out a notebook, take some notes, especially if you a parent, because I know it's going to have a great impact on you. My mom, Reverend Melody L. Seaton, is a pastor of Grace United Church in Salk Village, Illinois right now. Previously, she was an educator of 35 years, an administrator as a principal, an assistant principal, and also a math educator. Besides that, though, above that, she was an activist. She wasn't just a teacher. She was committed to the classroom, and she's still now committed to the community. She's an award-winning teacher, an award-winning pastor. She won the Dorcas Fellowship Award throughout her career, the New Life Compassion Award, the Orchid Award, the Royal Role Model Educator Award. She was also named the Salk Village Person of the Year in 2015. And besides that, something she doesn't talk about enough is how she got regional acclaim for introducing a model for uh, meditation in an urban school setting. Something that's going to become more commonplace now as we all endure this crisis that we're going through with this pandemic. So without further ado, y'all, I introduce the first episode of Black History Saved My Life featuring my mom, Reverend Melody L. Seaton. Let's get it. So for the people that don't know you, um, Reverend Melody Luana Seaton, a.k.a. my mama, a.k.a. <laughs> the amazing person in my life and in the world. <laughs> For people who picked up the book, they'll notice a consistent theme, especially throughout like the first <laughs> half of the book. And there's this name that just keeps popping up. <laughs> and as I was writing the book, it, it occurred to me, especially when I was reviewing it, it occurred to me that, wow, this might as well be called uh, Black History Saved My Life featuring my mama. <laughs> <laughs> Because every time I started something or got to the lesson or principle, it was like, well, my mama said this and my mama did this. And it's just the fact that you play such a, and you continue to play such an instrumental role in my life. So it's, it's different for me to introduce you. That's how a typical, you know, web series of podcast goes like this woman has done this and done that. Just looking on the sideline growing up outside of being my mother, I would say one of the most important historical figures in my life, just seeing so much of what you've done for other people as an educator, as a minister later in your life, and just as a servant of God, um, award-winning educator who has impacted thousands upon thousands of lives um, constantly to this day. I, I feel like now you transition to being on the global scale in terms of who you impact now, um, as opposed to just being limited to a classroom. So. For people who don't know you outside of my book or just me bragging about you, how would you introduce yourself? Who are you at this point in time in history, Reverend C? <laughs> wow. Um, well, I'm certainly a child of God. Um, and it, the journey to that um, has certainly been um, amazing 
in itself. And, and that's, that's a whole nother story. Uh, so I'm a child of God. I, and because I am a child of God, I am a leader. Um, I am a feeler. Um, I, I, I know I feel things that people are going through. My, my scope of, or my vision of the world is not just based upon what I see. Um, uh, what goes on in my life, but also what goes on in other people's lives. I'm, I'm attracted to that. I, 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 I feel the burden uh, of that. Um, and certainly I am one of my proudest moments is being a mom and being a grandmother um, has just truly blessed and enriched my life in, in so many ways. But I, I guess that's really all I can say. I'm a child of God and that encompasses so many things, uh, a servant of the Lord and uh, utilizing my gifts of nurturing, not only my own children and grandchildren, but other people and situations. That's good. So I want to get right to it. And I, and I really want to use this too from the vantage point of how we can also help parents because when you're raising black children in America, there's a different type of burden on you. And I think what people will find when they read the book is they'll realize that it's also somewhat of a parenting manual as well. And so it gets to a certain point where you see me break away and all the lessons I got from you, I now have to implement into my life. But especially dealing with this COVID crisis and as we record today, you know, of course, breaking news that the school year has been canceled for the rest of the year in Illinois. So parents are probably scrambling, what do I do? Um, how do I take care of my child? How do I instill principles in them? And I think throughout the book, they start to see these different things that we might encounter. So I just want to see what you were thinking from the vantage point of an adult when I was going through this as a child, because of course I interpreted a completely different way. And you can tell as, as you read through the book and as you um, just kind of browse through the chapter. So one of the first things we get right into is with chapter two. And <laughs> I, want people to, I want people to even understand because... <laughs> I don't think people realize like how pro-black our household was. Matter of fact, let's let's let let's let's start with that because you, <laughs> because oh we you know goodness. we Christian household went to church. Uh, you became a minister, I believe, when I was in high school. But we 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 lived in a Malcolm X household, is what I always tell people. Um, so what what if, before we even get to the chapter two? Um, what influenced that in your life in terms of what you put in our household and into our mindset? Mm. Well, um, the first time that I ever heard anything in my home was uh, in fifth grade. And I will never forget this as long as I live. I was um, the tallest girl in my fifth grade classroom and practically taller than a lot of the boys. I don't know what, what was going on, but I used to always have to sit, stand in the back row, be at the end of the line and all of that kind of stuff. And we had taken our pictures that day. And I was on the back row with all these boys and I came home and I was crying and I told my mom that I really didn't like myself. I, I just did not like myself. I, I did not like how I looked. I did not like uh, my stature. I didn't like anything about myself. And my mother stopped me in, in mid sentence and she said, wait a minute. First of all, I didn't give birth to any ugly children. Do you know that your ancestors were kings and queens from Africa? And that was the first time I had ever heard anything like that because nobody was talking about that in my school. Nobody was talking about that at church. Nobody was talking about that in our neighborhoods. We were too busy trying to be everything but black. And so when my mother said that, it never left me. Now, she didn't go deep with it, but it deposited something in me. And so um, all throughout my life, I was, I guess, maybe searching for, for those kings and queens or that king and queen that was inside of me. Um, and so um, I get to college and I decided to enroll in an African-American history course. It was the very first one that the University of Illinois uh, Chicago Circle offered. And so everybody was excited. Well, those of us that wanted to learn about our history. I had taken a couple classes in high school and they were okay. But when I got to my first class in, at the University of Illinois, wow, I was knocked off my feet. 
my professor and who happened to become your professor later on, yep, yep. <laughs> which is so <laughs> awesome and amazing. Yep. Dr. Gerald McWhorter, that's how mm -hmm. I knew him. Uh, yep. Was the, he and, and Dr. Uh, Marciliana, I think her name was Morgan. Both of them made our history come to life. I felt like somebody and, and I knew I was somebody. And I, at that point, began to exhaust everything that I could find about who I was because I was in school to become a teacher. And I wanted to make sure that I was able to share that with my uh, students. And I did. That's powerful. And I'm glad you brought up the, the point of what your mom said, my grandmother, because she's a prominent historical figure in her own right. Um, and she's done a lot. And I think that that's going to be an interview, of course, that further down the line as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think yeah. that what, what you say is very important because although we didn't have um, African curriculums as in-depth as we do now back then, my grandmother, your mother, knew enough about herself to know that she had to counter that negative perception. And I think that's important for parents to understand because what we're doing now is just setting the stage for what our parents, what our kids will accomplish later because I don't know everything. And I'm starting from a different point um, as a parent than I started as a child. I just want to set that foundation. So maybe if, if for parents, if we can just steer our kids in that direction, and then also kudos for you for even bringing it to your parents' attention, because I just came across an article recently about a young lady who committed suicide, a 15 years old, a black girl. And those rates are increasing because we need to get rid of those barriers that stop kids from communicating with their parents or communicating with adults or teachers at the school, because we have a very important impact. So if you can just kind of speak on how did that question and how did your situation your, and your experience in college then lead you down the path of education but not just education but service within education because you I don't feel like you were in love with the content and I think that's um a big distinguishing factor with educators do you love the content or do you love the children and I think you of course probably did love math but you love the children above all so what impact yes. is that Oh, wow. I, you know, from time to time, I've asked myself that. Um, I think, okay, so my dad um, was a big proponent of education, higher education. Um, he did not graduate from high school, even though he went and took college courses and was very successful. Um, but his big thing for us was that we were going to college. And so uh, I had a lot of educators in my family. Um, my, my aunts were, ed I had aunts that were educators. I had uncles that were educators. I had cousins who were educators. Going into teaching, especially for those from the South, was something that, you know, happened. So, so that was one of my role models, teachers. And so, of course, it became the first thing that I used to say when daddy would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would say, I want to be a teacher. And, and, and my sisters, over the years, my sisters, they would say different things. And um, Daddy would always say, um, but Melody, you're not going to make any money. And I would say, yeah, but I still want to be a teacher. <laughs> and <laughs> as the years went by, I never changed it. I kept saying I wanted to be a teacher. And I didn't understand that. Certainly at that point, over the years, I have been exposed to a, a variety of professions. Uh, but I still stuck with wanting to be a teacher. And then when I got to my first class, I understood there was something about young people that just lit my, my, my spirit up and um, I connected with them. Um, I, I guess because I was a young person and I was not the best young person. And so, especially going into classrooms where you had children who were troubled, um, I just felt like God placed me there for, for that, for that reason. If nothing else, if they didn't learn anything else, they certainly learned that I love them. And that was the most important thing. So tell me this. Um, I think one of the issues we have now in our community and in American society as a whole is we are overexposed to, and I think this is something interesting that's actually been said by a, a white anti-racist professor named Tim Wise, that black folks are often portrayed in the media as like the celebrity or like the criminal, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think you touch on something very powerful because like we'll see ourselves as rappers, athletes, entertainers. And then, of course, on the far end, we will see the 
one uh, prototype of like Obama, which is rare in the media anyway, is what, the way it's shown. On the flip side, we're overexposed to criminality in the media, or even within our music, criminality is often um, propagated a lot. But you say that your role models were educators. Um, and I want you to take, take the viewer or the listener into the social landscape of that time, because I don't want to put the age and everything out there, but because <laughs> that's not my place. <laughs> but you were you were raised in the midst of the civil rights era, Jim Crow period, the Black Power movement. Um, were you all like what type of what type of celebrities were you all exposed to? Because in our point in time in history, they're like people's role models more so than their parents, in my opinion. Mm. Well, first of all, I'm not ashamed of my age. I was born in 1957. I'm 62 years old. Uh, and yes, I was uh, um, coming up during the civil rights era, a little young at that point, you know, um, so not really fully understanding any of those things, uh, but feeling the impact of um, things when the, the, the household got excited, when the grown folks got excited and started talking about different things that were happening during that that period. Um, but you're right, as you were talking, I was trying to remember or think about who were our role models. And in addition to your family members, of course, I had some family members that you know, weren't educated. <laughs> um, but, um, I, but also, I heard about the more so about the civil rights people, you know, if anything. Um, so I think that was more of the consciousness then. Um, yeah, I mean, you would occasionally hear about sports um, athletes, um, but I couldn't tell you one, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, I just know what my, um, what my family members were doing and what we were told. I think it was, it was, it was, it was not just you know, the, the role models, it was what we were told and what was expected of us. We were expected to go to school. There was no, there were no if and buts about it. Uh, it was not negotiable. It, it just, we just knew <laughs> that we were going to college and we were, we were going to get an education. We, we just knew that. So hmm. that's powerful. And, and I think one of the things that has probably had a negative impact on us in terms of our goals and exposure is it's probably started to happen in the eighties, maybe around the time Jordan became a household name, but celebrities started to make so much more than a teacher or a doctor or educator whereas back then i think the I think the, the gap was a lot smaller you know um whereas now is when i you know when i was growing up it was i want to be an nba player not, not just because i love the game but because i see it as a way to make a lot of money right, <laughs> and right. have fun you know right, right, and right. the impact wasn't even on the mind so right. who were your who who was your celebrity idol outside of your family then? Who, was there like a Sidney Poitier? Was there like Harry Belafonte? Was oh, there, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, like Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. See, that's <laughs> uh, different though. That's yeah. Different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved Angela Davis, um, Stokely Carmichael. Mm. Um, yeah, the Sidney Poitiers, the Maya Angelos. Um, you know, because they were rare. We rarely see that the, the, the difference between what you and your sister and others have been exposed to is uh, being, uh, being born in 1957. First of all, um, television was not plentiful in, in households. Um, and we were not on the television as much. And, and to the point, to the extent of when we were, I would be the one running through the house, black people on TV, black people on TV. <laughs> it was just, it was a celebration because we were not there. So that was one way to kind of keep us limited in having, um, you know, role models. And thank God though, like I said, um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have people within my immediate sphere uh, who I could look up to. You know, uh, we were, uh, my mother worked at the time for a psychiatrist and oftentimes we would be invited to uh, their, his home. And so we got to go into other areas outside of where we lived on Morgan. 
We got to go to Hyde Park and, and the prestigious places like that. And then listen to the conversation. So now, oh, now psychiatrist is a, a possibility. Now it never was for me, but my sister eventually, one of my sisters eventually went into the medical profession. And so, um, so we were, we were exposed. We were, you had to take your kids out. You had mm -hmm. to, uh, show them the things that you were talking about. Uh, otherwise, it was really difficult to even know. Hmm. You know? That's, a, that's an interesting point because as you're speaking, I'm thinking about how when we watch television shows now and one of our big family shows could be like um, The Masked Singer, which I don't even know why I like now, but I've been sucking oh, in. Well, like, <laughs> so, some are like, you know, it's, it's a family friendly show, so we can watch okay, that together. Okay. Or like the cooking shows or, yeah. you know, blackish or, you know, whatever, mixed dish, mm -hmm. grownish, whatever. Mm -hmm. And whenever we watch these shows, Family Feud, our kids already know that we're rooting for the brown folks, the black folks. And yeah, I think you yeah. begin to pick that up. That's something that's passed down because we don't always see ourselves. We're not always on that victor victorious side unfortunately, as betrayed through the media. So that's an interesting point. And I'm wondering, so from a parental uh, standpoint, one of my big pet peeves now, and I get this from grandma, is I hate when our kids just, they're in front of their devices too long, you know? And this is somebody, you know, I used to love watching TV, but I, I, mm -hmm. I hate when they watch it too much, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, when you were growing up, was the same stigma associated with TVs in your household, or was there something like that that your parents tried to get you away to have you more involved or educated, I would say? Um, well, like I said, we didn't have many TVs in the house. Um, right. I, the color television didn't come out until I was like 15, 16, yeah. <laughs> something like yeah. that, you know. Right. But... Um, we watch TV more so as a family. Um, mm -hmm. The kinds of programming that's on now was never on, um, you know, mm -hmm. television. Um, television went off at a certain time at night, mm -hmm. just like the radio. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you didn't have to worry about anybody sneaking up in the middle of the night watching something after 10 o'clock or 10, 11 o'clock, because right, right. it was not, go they weren't going to find nothing, you know. Right, right. <laughs> uh, it was going to be black. So mostly my dad loved um, television. And he loved mm -hmm. cartoons. <laughs> so yeah. we, we watched a lot in Westerns. And so mm -hmm. we watched a lot of TV, you know, with him. And so I don't know that it was monitored so much. Uh, we did have to do our, you know, our studies. That was like first and foremost, before you could turn on the television, your homework had to be done. Um, we did have to read books and, and we, we played a lot. Uh, I had two younger sisters and, uh, we were encouraged to use our imagination. So we, we played a lot. I was a teacher. So I would come home and teach my sisters all that I had learned. So we didn't, we didn't spend a lot of time around TV, but I don't ever remember anybody saying don't because we did so many other things. We played, mm -hmm. we went outside, we jumped rope. Mm -hmm. uh, we were very athletic. And so by the time you finish doing all of that stuff, along with your homework, it's not much time to watch television. So. Yeah, and, and it seemed like society had a lot more parameters in place during that time anyway, whether it was purposeful or the fact that they didn't think it was a big money maker yet. Because when you say TV shuts off at a certain time, it reminds me because, you know, now we have the newborn. So we're mainly sleeping downstairs and you take the kids upstairs. They have that proclivity to want to come downstairs. But when they go up, we begin to watch shows that they ain't supposed to watch. Right, right, <laughs> so one, right. one of my things is if I know I'm getting sleepy, I'm about to like turn it to like a jazz station or R&B or some gospel. So if they come down and I'm asleep, they're not yeah. saying all the violence. And, and that's, that's probably something that was vastly different. And I think we mm -hmm. now we have, it's, it's a great thing to have technology because we can do this, but at the mm -hmm. same time, we have too many things to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. And now I guess we're forced to focus on each other. But talk more about my grandfather, Jimmy Knight. Tell us a little bit about him and his impact, because again, another important historical figure that has yes, a profound impact yes, on us. Yes. <laughs> wow, Jimmy Knight, Big Red. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny because I've been calling uh, Kaya Little Red. <laughs> I don't even know that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Red, Big Red. That was um, <clears throat> one of his many nicknames. But um, wow. <clears throat> 
what you know i wrote about my dad in my um my ordination paper and many other papers when i was in seminary because oftentimes you're asked the question of how do you come to your understanding of who God is in your life. And um, it, it, it started for me with my dad. Uh, before I fully understood uh, who God was and having a relationship uh, with the Savior and all of that kind of stuff, I had a relationship with my dad. And I know that I was very blessed um, to do that. But during the time that I was growing up on my block, everybody's dad was in, in the house, except for um, the one family where their dad passed away when we were in elementary school. Um, but <clears throat> for the most part, the block was full of moms and dads. You know, I don't know if everybody was happy or, you know, if everybody was married. I don't know any of those kind of things. I just know that it was rare to find somebody whose daddy wasn't in the home. But anyway, my dad uh, was, was very unique. My dad grew up real quick, early, I should say, uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, he had to take on a lot of responsibilities as a very young boy, and that really shaped who he was as a man. But one of the things my dad, uh, that was important to my dad was protecting my sisters and I. Um, protecting us, but also teaching us how to take care of ourselves. Uh, my dad actually taught us how to box. Uh, he wanted us to be able to fight. Um, you know, that was important to him that we could defend ourselves when we were not around him. Uh, but my dad was bigger than life. He was my, my savior. He was my protector. Um, he was someone who would get angry with me when I did things I wasn't supposed to, but he still loved me. Um, sometimes he even knew before I told him that I had done something wrong. At least I thought he did. I would find out later he didn't really know. He would just say, what, what's wrong? What you do? You know, and then I would just tell everything because <laughs> I thought he knew. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and so when I, and I say, I say, I also say this, there was a time in my life as I grew up that my dad became human. He used to be Superman, and then eventually I realized that he was actually just a man. He was a mortal. However, what I learned from him and how I felt uh, was easy to transfer to a love for God, because God is my superhero. You know, God is my savior. I fear and respect or respect uh, God. I know that God is going to take care of me. Sometimes I tell God what I've done, even if I'm not sure. I know God knows. But, you know, so, so my dad was all of that. My, my dad, um, the big things for us, though, was everybody in the hood. And I'm not talking about just the block. I'm talking about like a mile radius all the way around. Everybody knew not to mess with the night girls or the night gang is what my dad said. Because during that time, people were also recruiting for gangs. And um, so that's one of the reasons my dad taught us how to fight. But we were so afraid of my father that if somebody tried to recruit us or talk stuff, we would just say, look, come on, either we gonna whoop you or you gonna whoop us. But we not going home and tell my father that we joined a gang or that we did something we weren't supposed to because that whooping we gonna get at home is nothing compared to what you might try to do. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we just, we just did, we believed my father and we did not play around with him and neither did anybody else in the neighborhood. My dad had such a reputation that um, when I, the elementary school I attended most of the time was a block away. We would have to walk under the viaduct and then we'd be on our block. And so boys would try to talk to us, you know, be trying to holler at our ear and stuff like that. But when they would see my father, because he was a postman and he was always home when we got home, he would always be standing out on the porch and they would walk out in the street when they got to our house. Can you imagine? They didn't walk on the sidewalk. They go <laughs> out in the street and Morgan was a busy street. Mm -hmm. So they had to be careful not to get hit by a car. Because my father, they would say, hey, Mr. Knight. My father said, hey, keep walking. And that's what they did until they got from in front of our house. So my dad was just something else. He was, he was, he was something. And because of that, 
it made my sisters and I fearless. Um, it just, it, we just knew that there was nothing anybody could do to us. And that's amazing because people could have done something to us, but we walked around with that confidence that, no, you can't. And that's the same way I feel about my God. You can't do nothing to me. Hmm. And so. That's powerful. That, that reminds me of somebody I know. <laughs> <laughs> Because for the people out there that don't know, so we grew up, <laughs> there, there was a, a reputation too for somebody that's on this this uh, video with, with me right now. And people didn't want to mess with us when they were recruiting for gangs and stuff because they knew her reputation. So it's powerful. And then as you speak, and I'm understanding how deep this is because when I'm working out with my daughters downstairs, now I have three, right? Just in case of deja vu, when I'm working out with my two oldest daughters, um, they see me punching the, the punching bag and they want to start uh, messing around with it. So it's important that I teach them how to do that. And they, they got some cold right hooks and left hooks. Off. <laughs> <laughs> they got it naturally. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so let, let's, let's fast forward a little bit because yeah. you're speaking about some things that of course sound very relevant to me. And I can understand now why you were so headstrong with education and being determined with making sure your kids uh, valued themselves. So in the second chapter, I start the book and I'm talking about how I had uh, white friends that they were paired twins, of course, and well, twins, of course, and went over the house and that friendship kind of abruptly ended from the, my recollection. It was, of course, they were getting ready to move. But even prior to that, there was a conversation that you had with their mother. So for the people who don't know, in the book, I talk about how I'm on 128th and Sangam and I'm at a all black neighborhood, but I'm being bust out. We're in a red line mm. neighborhood. And I'm being bust out to a white neighborhood where we were segregated from. Mm -hmm. And first, second grade, of course, 90% of my friends are white. We didn't really care. And, you know, we shouldn't care. But there was a point where I realized that they looked at us differently. So from the parental perspective, what went into your mind when you had to have a conversation with me about um, not allowing me to continue with a group of people whose parents didn't really appreciate us and our surroundings the same way we appreciated them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. First of all, I just want to put this little caveat in. Um, that was not my first choice for schools for you to go to, for you and your mm -hmm. sister to attend. Um, I did apply to an all black language academy, um, somewhat in our neighborhood, but obviously they did not have enough places. And so this was offered to me. Um, I was very reticent about sending you guys there, but my sister encouraged me to do that because, as you said, um, she said, you got enough Shaka Zulu going on in this crib, <laughs> and so your kids are never going to forget who they are, <laughs> and they need the balance. And I prayed about it, and I did realize that <clears throat> this was an opportunity for you all that we did not have. Um, so, so anyway, um, so, you know, and, and so number two, uh, not wanting to send you into that kind of setting is probably in the back of my mind, I did not want to have to say things to you that would hurt you or say things to you that I could not fully explain or you would not truly understand. Um, so that was one of those situations. The, the twin boys were lovely little boys. Their mother was, uh, was named Melody or Melanie or something like that. We both had the same name. And we hit it all fine. Um, <clears throat> whenever um, you, I took you over there or they, you would usually go home with them because they lived like a block away, <clears throat> excuse me, from the school. And then I would pick you up. Um, we would have nice conversations and all of that. Well, after, you know, a few times, First of all, as a parent, I didn't think it was fair for you to always have to go to their house. That's number one. But secondly, um, I also wanted to be able to um, share uh, the hospitality, reciprocate the hospitality that she had been providing. And so I asked her if the boys could come to our home. And yes, our home was in an all black neighborhood, but uh, our home was much bigger than their home. And uh, matter of fact, you could put their home inside of our home. So, but she didn't know that, I'm sure, but it didn't really matter. But the point was, just like she cared for you and took care of you while you were in her home, 
I had in every intention of doing that and more for her boys. And I asked her, um, she said that her husband worked uh, evenings or afternoons or some shift. And that was her excuse. They didn't have but one car and she wouldn't be able to get them there. I said, okay. I think I asked her three times um, and offered different op options. Of course, one would have been to uh, actually bring them to the house and take them back home when you all had finished playing. But anyway, um, she always had some excuse. And then it occurred to me, these are not valid. She does not value my child. She does not think that our home is worthy of her children coming to. Now, it might not have been her. It could have been her husband. I had never met him because he was never home uh, when I was there. I'm not sure if you ever met him, but I never met him. And so at that point, I could not allow you to continue to think it was okay because this is what I know. We learn more of what's done or what's modeled than we do of what's said. Because oftentimes people will say things and they don't do exactly what they say or they don't mean what they say. And so I just had to say to you that if she could not allow them to come and play with you at your home, you were not going over there anymore and you were not happy with me. <laughs> and and I, I have to say that that brought me to tears. I was, I was so hurt that I had to tell my son that he could not play with, um, with children who he liked and they liked him. It really did. But I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't let that continue. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a very important. And it's a hard decision to make because, you know, I live in a mixed community now and I understand that my kids, uh, most of their friends are white now. And we've never had to really have that conversation um, yeah, but we've had conversations just about race and everything, but I already know just how difficult it would be for me, especially with Chloe, because she's a chip off the old block. <laughs> she's me, she's you, she's Jimmy. Yes, so, yes. but I, but I, I think it's, um, it's probably comforting to know that some years down the line that things worked out the way they were supposed to, but you already know I was probably irate <laughs> as yeah. much as I could show anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So but, but when, you, when you had to make that decision though, in the back of your mind, did you have that feeling of like, you know what, this is for the best anyway, it's going to work out despite how he feels about it? Um, I mean, it was going, it wasn't going, it was going to be what I said. That was, that's all there was to it. Um, I prayed that one day you and I would be able to talk about it and where you were old enough to understand why I made that decision. But in the meantime, because I think you were only about eight or nine years old, um, I just prayed. I prayed a lot. Um, I just prayed that God would um, keep you and, and protect you and that, yes, that one day you would understand why I had to make that decision um, and the pain behind um, having to say to my baby that, no, you can't play with them anymore. Hmm, that's deep. That's deep. That, um, so it, re it reminds me of, of course, another part of my childhood that's in the book when I talk about the Denny's episode. And I don't want to stick on that too long, but I just think it's, um, it's a consistent thing that I found as I was reflecting and right even talking now is you uh, wouldn't allow your children, regardless of how society viewed them, to be relegated to thinking that they were second class citizens, that they were less than because of the color of their skin. Um, I guess what I'm getting at now is what impact do you think that had as we fast forward to, and I believe this was chapter four, when we talk about the, the black president conversation, <laughs> because as I'm going through my childhood, I'm, I'm noticing the theme of like, okay, my mom's not tolerating any of this stuff. She's not letting this stuff, you know, um, really go on on her watch. And I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let the reader, you know, take some of the others. I don't want to give everything out on here, yeah, but yeah. there's a chapter where 
Well, I want to get straight to it. How did you feel when I stole on a bus driver? (laughs) 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 Because you're you're speaking these positive things. You're making sure I'm not, uh, you know, giving into society standards. You're giving me some structure. But then I'm still, I I think I I like to say my cutoff was around nine or 10. There's still Mm -hmm. a point where I'm hard headed though. I'm fighting. Mm -hmm. um, And you you found out that I hit a bus driver. So how did <laughs> how did you stay firm in your belief of who you who God intended for me to be, um, as opposed to let's say going uh, uh feeding into what the school system would say about our black boys? And I think this is a whole other conversation where you know because I might not sit down a lot or I might want to jump around or it's hard for me to sit still. Um, that right. they might try to mislabel us as having ADHD or right. behavior disorder, or I could have easily been labeled that. And I'm not sure what went on mm-hmm. um, behind the scenes, but I'm sure mm-hmm. you probably had some role in making sure none of that type of stuff happened. But what's your reaction and response at that point in time, and even now for parents that deal with that? So, you know, as a as a woman of God, we try to say that we separate the, the sin from the sinner, so to speak. Um, that it's not the person, but it is the sin within the person. And so you don't, you learn to not dislike the person, but the behavior that they have. And you try to, to minister to that behavior. So um, I, um, because I just needed my children to feel good about themselves and to not be superficial, uh, to not, you know, just to not be what the the world expected of them, but to be who God uh, created them to be. Um, There were just a lot of decisions and and things I had to make about something. So for example, you were very, very, um, very, 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 very active uh, and in trouble quite a bit. Um, as a young boy, and I was very frightened and worried <laughs> that you were not going to become the, the man that you are that I am so proud of. Uh, but I so, I'm so grateful to God that even before I really knew God the way I knew God, there was something inside of me that said, well, first of all, you brought this child into the world. God blessed you with this gift, and you have got to nurture this gift because this came, he came from God. And so um, that meant that sometimes I had to support you, defend you, and chastise you. And so I would not allow any teachers to call you bad. And I had a teacher, uh, I think it was your first or second grade teacher, and she would call every day. And most every day you got a whooping. Your dad had the belt hanging on the door, and you got a whooping. And so it wasn't like we weren't doing what we were supposed to do as parents we talk to you, we, we beg you to, put, you know, to not embarrass us, you know, and all of those kind of things. And it wasn't working. But one thing I was not going to tolerate is I was not going to let anybody say that you were bad. They could not say that in front of me. And they better not say it to you because there was nothing bad about you. You were my child. I gave birth to you. I carried you. God gave you to me. But your behavior was bad. Your behavior was inappropriate. And so for one teacher, I recommended to her that I would get her a copy of Jawanza Kanjufu's book, The Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Male Child, and that I expected her to read it because she better not ever call my house again and say that you were bad. And that was that. I did give her a copy of that book. I don't know if she read it, but she didn't call and say you were bad anymore either. Um, so getting, you want me to talk about the bus driver situation. Yeah, I mean, we, we, don't, yeah. we don't have to give like all the details. They can read the book, but yeah, yeah, just, uh, you yeah. know, <laughs> I keep, I'll keep it short for the people, but you know, yeah. I um, had a situation, me and my best friend, and we were on the bus and um, the bus driver took my toy as he should have, cause I wasn't listening and I was probably putting him in danger, playing with my toy the way I was. And he didn't give it back to me on the way off the bus. And I just started swinging on him and, um, <laughs> I got into a lot of trouble. Um, and of course, something very powerful happened that same school year that we'll talk about in a second. But just uh, like, again, from, from your perspective, because I wrote for mine, 
how did you, I don't know you said all of that nice stuff, all the spiritual talk and everything. <laughs> but, but, but how did you I say then. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how does, how, how does, <laughs> How does this, and I think you did a good job of actually explaining this too for parents that might deal with their kids in a similar situation, because you're saying remove the behavior from the person. Yeah. And I think that's an important distinction to make, especially for a child, because that's something mm -hmm. that I unknowingly do as well, because I can never tell a parent, even I teach high schoolers, I can never tell you that your child is bad. They might be doing something that's bad, but I see their potential. And of course, mm -hmm. it's like, why even get into education or why work with kids if you don't see these kids as seeds that are supposed to sprout into something great, Amen. you know? So I think on the, the inverse of that is, I also came home one day and I, I asked you, the, this is the question that whenever I, I speak about it um, at a school or whatever, everybody's like, what? She said, what? So <laughs> when I came home, this is, people got to understand, this is pre-Obama. This is um, yeah. when we talk about, um, you know, Tupac having a song and he's just, uh, you know, even though it seems having sent, we ain't ready to have a black president. Even as a child, I think that we all kind of felt like, well, it's never really going to be one, not in our lifetime. So how did you muster the, <laughs> <laughs> the courage to tell this little black child from the south side of Chicago um, what you told him? And I'll let you uh, say what you told me <laughs> when I came home and asked why we never had a black president. Oh, <laughs> well... Uh, I would like to also add, too, that in addition to separating the behavior from the person, um, we also have to remember who we were. And so I know that I was responsible for teaching you to be kind of rough <laughs> because that's what I was taught. So I always had to check myself to see if I had kind of gone overboard when you did certain things. But anyway, um, so because you're my child, and not just because you were my child, but I had a lot of children. You are my biological child, but I, God blessed me to love many, many children. And I always wanted the best. I wanted you, my dad used to tell us all the time, you work hard enough to give your kids better than what we gave you. And my dad and my mom gave us a lot, uh, you know? And so I felt like, oh my gosh, that's a tall order. But anyway, um, to be honest with you, I didn't know how I was going to answer it. But at the point that you asked that question, uh, Ernest, uh, not only was I becoming into my own as a, uh, um, a person called by God to serve, I was, I was, I was spilling things. I was hearing things. I was praying more and, and, and all of those, those things. And, and so we were, Actually, we were all upset. The whole family was upset because Jesse Jackson had run for president and he had lost. And I think you might have even heard a conversation uh, about that. I'm not sure. But anyway, when you asked the question, it was kind of like, hmm. <laughs> and as you were phrasing the question, I had gotten into the habit a long time ago of asking the Holy Spirit to speak, especially if I didn't know how to answer something. And the words that came out of my mouth, Ernest, that was not me. I didn't know how I was going to answer you. But, I, but, the, but the Holy Spirit spoke through me and said to my son, Ernest, we're waiting on you to grow up. And you had the biggest smile on your face. And I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> because what was I supposed to say? I couldn't look you in your eye and say to you, no, you will. I don't know why we don't have a black president. Because that's what I was mm -hmm. really thinking. I don't know why they won't let us, you know, uh, hold a, the highest office in the land. We're mm -hmm. just as smart as anybody else. I couldn't look at you and say that. So. Mm. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. So that's a message to the parents out there. We got to let the Holy Spirit speak. First yes. and foremost, but speak to what our kids speak yeah. to the potential to the yes. potential, not the pain, right? Yes. Um, and so something else I want to talk about, it's something I've spoken about when I'm on WVON, and I believe I mentioned it in the book as well, but you weren't just um, caught up in simply parenting us. This was something that you extended to your students as well. So mm -hmm. my first time, this is kind of crazy because all around this time, as I asked that question, I fight the bus driver, 
Um, we at my first book uno unofficially was actually when I become the first black president when That's I was right. That's right. <laughs> around That's that right. same time, though, you raise money to take your eighth grade class to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And you would also take some of your children, um, your students to church. Mm -hmm. um, one of those kids would eventually begin to work for you. So <laughs> what, where did you get that from? Is that grandma? Is that granddad? Is it just <laughs> something that was inside of you? Because a lot of people don't go, people, a lot of folks, when they teach or they work their job, as soon as that bell rings, they mm -hmm. out of there. Why yeah. did you uh, keep the class going outside of school? So uh, I grew up with two Southern parents. Daddy was from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Mama was from Bolton, Mississippi. And in our household, uh, they were always helping somebody. I don't even know anything other than that. Um, and not just in my household and my aunt's households and all of that. Everybody helped each other. And so there was nothing uh, to have somebody from down South come and need a place to stay for a little while until they got their lives together. And my sisters and I would have to give up our room and we would take our sleeping bags and we'd sleep under the dining room table in the, the, the dining room or wherever we could find a spot because and we just, we made an adventure of it. We just thought that was what everybody did. I was really surprised when I became an adult and started talking about stuff like that. And some people my age were looking at me like I was crazy because I thought everybody's household did that. You know, my mother loved to cook. And so she was going to cook, 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 cook. My daddy uh, loved to entertain and crack jokes. And so, you know, I just grew up like that. So, okay. So I grew up like that. And that filtered into who I was as an educator. It, it just did. Um, you know, when I saw children that did not have, then I, it, it was hard for me not to share. And it was rough during some of the time that I would take some of those kids to church because um, I only had a certain amount of money. And you and your sister were accustomed to us always getting McDonald's or something, you know, after service. And so... If I had more kids in the car, <laughs> that meant less hamburgers and less french fries. And you didn't like that. <laughs> less happy meals, less happy meal toys. <laughs> right, right. So I don't know. I, I always prayed that you and your sister would never think that I loved you all less uh, because I did that. But I know one time I did have to say to you that God had just given me a really big heart. Uh, to love other children, uh, because I didn't think you understood why I was always doing the things that I did. It was just, it was just hard, Ernest, um, to see that. Um, there were times growing up in my life where we were, it, things were rough for us. And so I just think that when you're able to come out of that, when, when you're able to see yourself to the other side, you don't, you're not supposed to forget um, you're supposed to reach out or reach back as the Sankofa bird mm -hmm. does, fly forward and, and look backwards. So I just mm. did it. Well, that's ingrained in our culture. And, and what's uh, deep about that too is, you know, I, I start the conversation and I say, well, you're like, you know, super pro-black. And I know uh, my grandparents were, you know, the education was, was a very important foundation, mm -hmm. but unknowingly they they were instilling African principles in you right. um, that of course you passed down to me. That's something that your, your, your father did, your mother did. And it's something I'm passing on to my kids. Even with me and, my, and Cassie, they're able to see how much our students love us. When we're out in public, sometimes they see us. And in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, I have to measure up to what you did because the, <laughs> I mean, the, the bar is you took kids to Washington, D.C., a group of black kids in the 90s to D.C., right. you know, so just imagine what people were thinking on that plane and the hotel and everything. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't know for sure, but were you the only uh, adult on that trip? No, no, no. Okay, I'm about uh, to say, they probably yeah. wouldn't let that happen. No. <laughs> no, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't let us go. We did have to have chaperones. Yeah. We had chaperones, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's deep. I love that. I love that. So I want to play, uh, before we wrap it up, I want to play a quick game. So two things. So uh, the first thing is going to be word association. So I'm going to say a couple words or a couple phrases, whatever. And I want you to explain to the viewer this first thing that pops up in your head. So first thing would be 75th and Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> that was where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> that's the block. <laughs> that's the block. <laughs> All right. Okay. 
Um, next one would be um, your favorite book. The Bible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, and so of give, course, give, you know, of course, now it's Black History Saved My Life. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Make sure y'all get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> a very, a very far number two on the list. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah, but it's, that's all right. It's oh yeah. Two. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> the best-selling book of all time. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. And uh, this one is really going to get you. We didn't get a chance to talk about him. Um, uh -oh. first thing that pops up with Harold Washington. My second hero. How could mm. I have forgotten Harold Washington? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Talk a little bit about that impact. Cause you would always <laughs> tell me that, um, when, when I was in the belly, you were campaigning yeah. for Harold yeah. Washington. And it's funny yeah. coming full circle when I was in yeah. college campaigning for Barack Obama. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talk yeah. about Mr. Washington. Oh my gosh. Uh, matter of fact, both times I was pregnant, he was running. So when I was carrying your sister and you, um, I uh, had the pleasure of being able to work on his campaign. So this man just appears to, I guess, out of nowhere, but for me, it was out of nowhere. I'm sure he was known in other circles. And he was such um, an articulate, and I don't, I don't mean that in the way that sometimes it's used to demean us. Uh, but when you don't see a lot of us in positive, in the positive light, and here is this awesome man uh, speaking so knowledgeably, and he looks like you, I was just, oh my gosh. And when he would, and, and this is so funny, his vocabulary was so extensive that I had a dictionary by the television. Because whenever he was on the TV, I wanted to be able to look up every word that he uh, said so that I could understand <laughs> what he was talking about. He, well, the brother was deep, you know. And so I just said, if, if this man runs, I am going to campaign. And so I, I'm, I think it, no, it was with your sister that I had to have students. I had to teach students how to do it because that was the first time he ran. And then with you, it was a little bit easier to get around and to do some things. And I was able to do things on the telephone, call people and, and, and ask them who are they planning to vote for and, and then try to convince them to, you know, vote for him. Um, just to be, and then, and then uh, you know, he died shortly after you were born. And I had students who actually uh, were a part of the, the cause with me. Uh, who either were able to vote for him that second time or just missed it, but went down to see his body lie in state and, and share with me how important that was that I involved them in that process, even though they were in sixth, seventh grade and couldn't vote. Uh, mm. They understood the enthusiasm and the excitement about a Black man running for mayor of the city of Chicago the city that we lived in, you know? So, um, yeah. I, oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't know how I could have forgotten that. <laughs> yeah. Powerful. So I guess just to kind of segue that into, um, another question, I'm probably gonna have to find a different way to call this segment because Mount Rushmore actually has a negative connotation in native American culture. So I want to mm. respect the indigenous people because, um, from my memory, Mount Rushmore was actually uh, built on sacred Native American territory. Mm -hmm. So I guess with that said, I'll just say, <laughs> give me your top four, um, your top four historical figures or the four people that have impacted you the most in your life and that have saved your life. Well, besides my mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so let's say, uh, yeah. ex excluding parents, yeah, so. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, Malcolm X, <laughs> uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, gosh, Angela Davis. Oh, gosh, there, there's, oh my gosh, there have been numerous teachers, um, Miss Sims was my first grade and my fifth grade teacher. Miss mm -hmm. Coffee was my seventh and eighth grade teacher. Um, wow. Um, 
Gosh, I, and that's that's rough because yeah, I, I yeah. there are so many people that you know um, have touched my life mm -hmm. and and helped me make those turns and pivots. Uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Jeremiah Wright mm. um, certainly was uh, pivotal in my faith journey because I had never experienced worship like Trinity ever <laughs> before because I grew up Lutheran. So that was that was something. Um, yeah, there were there. Oh, gosh, that's that's wow. That's a question, because not just famous people, there are people, everyday people that I've walked past that have impacted my my life and, and saved it uh, because just because of who they are the doctors uh, Dr. Gail Floyd who used to be not only you all's doctor but my doctor as well um, you're probably gonna have to stop me because names are gonna keep going no, no, just keep going matter of fact I, I just had an idea because I said I wanted to respect our indigenous brothers and sisters so I can't yeah. call it the Mount Rushmore segment but yeah. it's almost like people who would go in your 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 history museum, you know, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. Because even think about DC, now we have the African American, the Smithsonian Museum. So mm -hmm. the people who are going your history museum, that might be a good way to phrase it. <laughs> oh, I like that, I like that. Um, yeah. My One of my uncles is a United States Congressman, uh, Congressman Benny Thompson from uh, the second Cong congressional district in Mississippi would certainly be somebody in my museum. Um, oh gosh. Um, Oh, there's so many sisters. Um, a lot of the sisters that are in Congress right now, um, I, I just, they're just, I just love them. Uh, it's just awesome to see these young ladies um, make it, make that path, uh, make that step. Um, um, wow. Yeah, <laughs> you would have to right? give me some time to do that one. I'd have yeah, to do yeah. That. yeah. That's, that's a deep one a right there. People. Yeah, I, I could feel a museum, definitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, sir, I do not profess to have ever achieved any of this on my own. And um, I'm just so grateful for the people, the, the, the great African-Americans, whether they were considered great or not. Uh, mm -hmm. They were great in my eyes uh, yeah, because yeah. of the things. My aunts, my, my Aunt Charlie, my, my Aunt Myrtle, my Aunt Susie, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, th those were the women. Um, you know, they, they were something. So. Yeah. 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 We, we come from a, a family, a very strong woman. I was saying, I'm not sure yeah. if I told you too, but I was like, man, it's funny because, you know, I was raised by so many strong women in my life and now I have mm -hmm. to return the favor. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I got three baby girls yeah, and I raised yeah. up the same way. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. Yeah. Life comes yeah. full circle. So yeah. the, la the very last question that I want to ask you, is um, when, and this is going to be another deep one. Uh -oh. So what will the history books say about Reverend Melody Juana Seton? When it's all said and done, what will the history books say about you? Mm -hmm. What will your impact be? <sighs> well, I pray that the history books will say that I, I loved people that I was the person that would literally give you the coat off my back, um, that I, I really cared about African people and, and believed in our ability to do things, do the things that we were created to do, which is the same as any other uh, group of people. Uh, certainly and foremost, that I love the Lord. Uh, but that I was never, uh, I never said I was a perfect person, I, I, that, I, that, that uh, she was transparent, that um, she would let you know that, yeah, I did that too, but look at where I am now. Yeah, I went through that, but it didn't stop me. And so I guess that's it. I love it. I love it. And I think with that said, now is a perfect time uh, <laughs> to go ahead and wrap it up. And before we leave, I want the viewers to make sure they know your church home, where you're at, where they can yeah. follow you on social media, yeah. all that good stuff, so they yeah. can continue this conversation with you. So go ahead and let them know. Amen. I am the senior pastor, senior and founding pastor of Grace 
United Church of Christ in Sauk Village, Illinois. Our address is 2500 223rd Street. Um, and I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for that opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, we're almost six years old. And so we are so grateful uh, for that. Uh, we have a food pantry on Wednesdays. Once we get back into our buildings, uh, we will definitely uh, resume serving God's people in that manner. And our services are on Sunday, uh, starting with Sunday school at 930 and worship at 11. Um, and we have Bible study on Thursdays at 7. And, and in lieu of sheltering in, um, we are still trying to be faithful to those commitments, everything except for the food pantry, because that involves the building. But on, at 9.30 on Sunday mornings, we do have a prayer line, and that information can be found on all social media uh, platforms, the number as well as the access code. And then we have worship at 11 o'clock via Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube. We're on all of them. And Bible study as well on Thursdays at 7. Amen. Amen. So <laughs> everybody out there, make sure you follow her on social media, follow the yes. church, visit yes. in person digitally, yes. um, all that good stuff. And of yes. course, share this far and wide. This is a powerful conversation. If yes. you read the book, you understand how important this is. If you have not read the book, go ahead and read it after this so you understand why this is powerful. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. share it to everybody. Comment below something you've taken away from it. And we'll see you next time. We love you. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.